Welcome to Margs and Mayhem, where I tell you a true crime story and we drink. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you choose to enjoy one of our themed margaritas, please ensure that you are of legal drinking age and have fun but drink responsibly. classic margarita that uses honey instead of simple syrup. A note on the margaritas. They are all my own mixes and I tend to like my margaritas to be a little sweeter than perhaps some other people or a little bit more tart. But if you like your drinks more dry, you can always adjust the recipe. This margarita, for example, tastes really heavily of honey, which I wanted it to, but maybe you don't like honey as much, so you can always do a half a part of honey or less depending on your taste preferences. As always, the margarita recipe for this week and next week are in the description box so that you can drink along if you choose. Today we drink a honey margarita because of Winnie Ruth Judd, otherwise known as the Trunk Murderess and a variety of other names which we'll talk about later. This crime was a media sensation at the time, but now is relatively unknown. Also what's relatively unknown is what actually happened that night, but I'm excited to explore it with you today. So let's get started. Winnie Ruth McKinnell was born in a blizzard in the middle of Iowa on January 29th, 1905. She went by Ruth her whole life, so we'll call her Ruth. Her dad was a Methodist minister and her mom was a homemaker. She also had a younger brother named Burton. From the time she was a small child, Ruth showed both a strong desire to have children one day and a tendency to compulsively lie. When she was just seven, she ran around the neighborhood telling everyone she saw that her mom was going to have a baby. But as soon as the neighbors went to congratulate her mom, she told them the truth. She wasn't pregnant. As a teenager, she claimed she was pregnant by her boyfriend, but she was a virgin. This was a fact that was confirmed by her doctor. She then ran away, and when she returned, she claimed she'd been kidnapped and had the baby, but there was no baby. As you can see, Ruth showed signs of mental illness from early on in her life. Ruth's first job was an attendant at the Indiana State Hospital, where she would meet her future husband, Dr. William Judd. Dr. Judd was 43 years old, and Ruth was 17. William was a World War I veteran and suffered from war injuries. This left him addicted to morphine. The couple married in 1924, but things were very unstable. William struggled keeping a job because of his morphine addiction, and they moved around a lot. They lived in Mexico for a while and then in Laredo. By 1930, they were living mostly separately and in separate cities, but they did talk to each other all the time. Ruth contracted tuberculosis and moved to Phoenix, Arizona without William because there was a belief that a drier climate would lead to a quicker recovery from TB. Phoenix, Arizona was a fairly large desert town in 1930 with a population of about 50,000 people. Model T's made up the downtown traffic. Rush hour was a thing of the future. It was, in fact, the midst of the Great Depression. Ruth's first job in Phoenix was as a nanny for the Lee Ford family. Next door lived John J. Halloran, or... Happy Jack. He co-owned the Halloran Bennett Lumber Company and was a well-known playboy and womanizer. Happy Jack quickly set his sights on Ruth. Though Happy Jack and Ruth were both married, they would start their affair on Christmas Eve of 1930. It would continue until the night before Ruth murdered her two best friends. Hedvig Samuelson, who went by Sammy, was born on November 17, 1907. When she turned 21, she moved to Juneau, Alaska to become a teacher. It was there she would meet Agnes and Leroy, and the two would quickly become best friends. Sammy was diagnosed with tuberculosis, and the two of them decided to move to Phoenix, Arizona, where Anne would take care of Sammy, who ended up being homebound in the last year of her life. Agnes Leroy, who went by Anne, was born in Oregon on January 12, 1904. After becoming a registered nurse, she moved to Wrangler, Alaska in 1929. In February of 1930, she moved to Juneau to take a higher paying position where she would meet her future best friend, Sammy. When Sammy contracted tuberculosis, they both decided to move to Phoenix, Arizona with the hope that the dry climate would help and took a job as an x-ray technician at a local clinic. By unfortunate happenstance, Ruth had also taken a position as a secretary at that very clinic. 
The three became friends, playing the world's most complicated board game, Bridge, and party after party after party, fueled by crates of bootleg booze. Anne, Sammy, and Ruth even tried living together at one point, but things were a little crowded for the three ladies, so Ruth ended up moving out. Our friendly Casanova, Happy Jack as it turns out, loved both partying and dating as many women as possible. He was blatantly sleeping with all of Ruth's friends, including Sammy and Anne, at the same time. But it was Anne's affair that enraged Ruth. I'm going to read you a section from her 1933 confession letter so that you can see what I mean. Day after day, she lorded it over me, always smiling and fresh and sweet, well knowing she was hurting me with her taunts. Ruth's husband, William, who'd been in a rehab facility in California, dried out just long enough to visit Ruth for a short time before having to return to Los Angeles. This left Ruth in an increasing jealous frenzy against Anne. In her own words, she would say she was losing her mind. On the night of October 16th, 1931, Ruth snapped. She got a gun and a knife, and she went over to Anne and Sammy's bungalow. She fell asleep on the couch, clutching the gun, and no one knew she was there. The next morning, she was wakened early by the sounds of the milkman delivering milk. When she heard Sammy go into the bathroom, she went into the bedroom and shot Anne in the face. Sammy, obviously confused, called out, What fell, Anne? Sammy rushed back to the room and saw Ruth there with the gun. She jumped on top of her and managed to wrestle it away from her. Ruth fled to the back door and grabbed the knife, returning and stabbing Sammy in the shoulder. There was a wrestling match, basically. Winnie got shot in the hand, and she managed to get the gun back from Sammy and shot her and killed her. Ruth maintained for the rest of her life that she didn't want to kill Sammy, but she did. Collateral damage, I suppose. After the death of both girls, Ruth shoved Sammy back into the bathroom and went into the garage and found a very large trunk. She brought it back into the house and managed to stuff Anne into it and inch by inch dragged it into the living room. By that time, she realized that she had to go to work. So she went to work, pretended like nothing had happened, and when work got out at 4 p.m., she went to her house, got a couple of things, and fed her cat before returning to the bungalow. At this point, Sammy's body was not really going anywhere. It was stiff from rigor mortis. So according to Ruth, she went into the kitchen, got a couple of cheap knives, and started cutting up Sammy's body. Uh, you should probably start drinking. Whoops, I should have said that earlier. Anyway, she managed to find three bags to fit the different parts of the dismembered body of Sammy into, and those got dragged into the living room as well. So according to Ruth, she really had no plan. The only plan she'd had was to kill Anne, and once that was done, she did not know what to do next. So she decided to go visit her brother. Remember Burton? Anyway, by this point, he's a junior at the University of Southern California. So Ruth buys a ticket, gets the luggage boys to come to her house to pick up the very heavy luggage and pack it on a train bound for Los Angeles. On October 18th, when the train arrived in Los Angeles, the scheme quickly unraveled. Sorry, this is gruesome, but there was things leaking from the suitcase and quite a foul odor coming from the suitcase. The station agent demanded that Ruth open the suitcase, but she claimed she didn't have the key. Whoops, lost the key. Anyway, apparently they didn't really think much of it because at the time, people were known for like bringing deer, like dead deer across state lines, which was illegal, but people really wanted venison, I guess. I don't really know. But they, they obviously didn't think it was a body, but they didn't know what it was. Meanwhile, Ruth fled the station with her brother, has a short conversation with him, and then just disappears. She was walking all over Los Angeles and all the way to Pasadena, meanwhile, with a bullet in her hand, festering. This is becoming a sensation because obviously they managed to get the cases open and they realize it's gruesome contents. And so Ruth is the prime suspect and her face is plastered all over newspapers. So she's sort of hiding and sort of listening. At one point, she hears a, a passerby reading the article about her out loud. 
In the article, William had put a a call out of uh, begging her to turn herself in and a phone number for her to call. So she listens to the number and she gives him a call. And William sends a guy to pick her up. He brings her to a funeral home where she reunites with him before turning herself into police. Ruth was nearly mobbed by the photographers on the steps of the funeral home and thus began the media sensation known as the trunk murders. Ruth herself became known as the trunk murderess, sometimes the velvet tigress, the blonde butcher, or any other number of nicknames the press decided to give her. Her picture and story were plastered across newspapers from coast to coast. The story was so compelling that people couldn't be kept away. William Randolph Hearst, the king of yellow journalism himself, put up $20,000 for Ruth's legal defense. He likely did it because she promised him an exclusive on her life story. That and she was already selling him quite a bit of newspapers. Ruth's massively publicized trial began on January 19, 1932. Ruth's version of the events at that moment was that the crimes had happened in self-defense. Her lawyers went with an insanity defense. Neither one of these worked. In February of 1932, she was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. This was only for the crime of killing Anne. She was never tried for Sammy's murder. The jury handed this sentence down in part because they believed there was no way she could have done this herself, and they were hoping that if they sentenced her to death, the maximum penalty allowed, that she would squeal on her accomplice. In fact, that's a lot of where the controversy for this case comes from. People have a hard time believing that a frail, tuberculosis-ridden woman would be able to drag dead bodies across the living room floor, or that she would be able to dismember bodies. So many people believed there was an accomplice. And who do you think the number one suspect for an accomplice was? You got it. Happy Jack. Truth be told, Ruth told lots of stories about what happened that night before her 1933 confession letter and after. It's hard to tell what's the truth and what she told to try and save herself. It does seem unlikely that such a well-connected, wealthy guy like Happy Jack would go to such strange lengths to cover up a murder he wasn't even there for. Even Ruth's husband, William, he said he knew Happy Jack and he didn't think there was any way that Happy Jack had any part of it. In January 1933, a grand jury did indict Happy Jack as an accomplice to the murders. Their star witness, Ruth Judd. She added to her story of self-defense that Happy Jack was there after the murders and helped with disposal of the body, including Sammy's dismemberment. Happy Jack's lawyers and Happy Jack himself maintained that this was testimony of a crazy person. Apparently, the judge agreed and the case was immediately dismissed. Meanwhile, Ruth was still set to hang. At the 11th hour, the prison warden at the prison she was staying at found an old loophole that said, If the warden himself thought that an inmate was insane, he could request an insanity hearing. And so he did. She was declared to be insane, and she was moved to the Arizona State Mental Hospital. The Arizona State Mental Hospital, like most mental hospitals at this time, was understaffed, underfunded, and there wasn't really a lot of knowledge about the needs of patients at the time. In fact, this particular hospital where Ruth went was the most overcrowded in the country. Ruth made the best of it. She started doing hair. Uh, The inmates would come to her when the hospital would have dances and they would get their hair done. And the nurses even started going to get their hair done from her as well. Many people noted that she seemed like a member of the staff more than a patient. Only one thing would set her off. Happy Jack often showed up at those dances and he would stand around and sneer and laugh at her. Eventually, he was banned from coming. But the story's not over yet, friends, and I still have Marg. Starting in 1939, Ruth escaped the asylum, and then she escaped again and again and again. She escaped seven times, and in one escape, she walked to Yuma, Arizona, a distance of over 180 miles. Ruth escaped for the last time on October 8th, 1963, using a key for the front door that a friend had given her. She remained on the loose for years. In fact, she changed her name to Marion Lane and began work as a live-in maid in a big mansion overlooking San Francisco Bay. The family loved her. 
The police caught up with her in 1969. However, in 1971, the Arizona governor paroled her permanently, and in 1983, the state of Arizona issued her an absolute discharge, basically freeing her permanently. Happy Jack Halloran was fired by his business partners in the lumber company for the scandal he had caused. He died in obscurity in 1939. Many people believe that Happy Jack was the killer of these two young women, or at the very least an accomplice to the crime. But the letter written in 1933 by Ruth is well regarded to be the most accurate, truthful, and honest confession made by Ruth, and in that he's innocent. Winnie Ruth Judd returned to a quiet life going by Marion Lane with her dog Skeeter. She died in 1998 at age 93 in her sleep. More than anything, she had hoped for the day when people would stop talking about Winnie Ruth Judd. The house where Anne and Sammy were murdered still stands in Phoenix, Arizona. It's known as the Death House or the Murder House. So creative. It's a short, stocky building, gray in color, that is surrounded on all sides by high-rise buildings. It's private property, but you can drive by anytime you'd like. In 2007, a feature-length film called Murderous, the Winnie Ruth Judd story was released, and it told the story completely by puppet. I gotta tell you, I looked everywhere for that. Everywhere. Hours. And I could not find it, and I'm very sad about that. So what do you think? Did Winnie Ruth Judd accomplish this murder on her own? Was Happy Jack an accomplice? Was there another accomplice? Who was she protecting? Was she protecting anyone? Was Sammy really just collateral damage? How about that compulsive lying? Can you see it throughout her life? Can we believe anything she says or writes? Did she know right from wrong when she entered Anne's bedroom? Or was her mental illness so strong that she couldn't see what was right and what was wrong? Was she the villain or the victim? I want to know what you think. I think one of the biggest tragedies in most murder cases is how little is known about the actual victims. I had to do hours of digging to find out the little scraps of information that I found about Anne and Sammy. It makes sense, but I wish I could give their lives as much depth as I could, Winnie Ruth Judd, but it just wasn't possible. I suppose that's in part because she took away their lives so tragically young. Thanks for hanging out. I upload every Thursday, and if you want to know more, check out the description box for my socials. See you next week. Cheers!